Romans chapter 7. A little bit of a tricky passage today, so we'll try to go through it and hopefully uh, shed some clarity on it. Here in Romans chapter 7, Paul has spent the last number of verses impressing upon the believer that we are not under the law. The law is what gave sin its power. Sin was what had us in bondage through the law. When we were delivered from sin by the work of Christ, we also were set free from the law. Well, this whole discussion doubtless had people wondering, if the law was part of what held me in bondage to sin, does that mean that the law is a bad thing? When we rejoice that we are not under the law, when we refuse to allow legalists to bring us back under the law, are we saying that the law is bad, evil, sin itself? Well, of course, that would be obviously a dangerous way to think. God himself gave the law. And while it contains many commands that we don't live by today, I'm glad we uh, can eat bacon and that we don't offer burnt offerings unless I'm cooking. There's a lot of the law that would cause society itself to disintegrate if it weren't followed. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. We're just as much a part of the law as the command not to have a mule or to offer burnt offerings. If the law is sin, then everything in it would be wrong, and the believer should actually do the opposite of everything that's in the law. And of course, we know kind of instinctively and intuitively that that's not right and that's not true, because God's given us a conscience, His Holy Spirit's convicted our hearts, there's something built into us that lets us know when we do wrong. So what is the deal with the law? It's obvious that we aren't under it. It's obvious that it was the strength of sin. When we were delivered from sin, we were set free from the law. We should never allow anyone to bring us back under the law. But then what is it to us? And that's what Paul kind of addresses in these next few verses here in Romans 7. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So there it is. He asks you just point blank. Look, if the law is something we're set free from, don't live in oldness of letter and so on. If it's the strength of sin, is it sin itself? And he says, God forbid. That is the strongest negative he could possibly give. We don't even have English words for the negative that he uses here. And so they say, God forbid. It is unthinkable, inconceivable that the law itself would be sin. He says, on the contrary, I wouldn't have known sin if it weren't for the law. The law was what alerted him to sin. Now, he did not need the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments and all those other instructions. He didn't need that to know that sin existed. Anyone can look at the world and see genocide and see murder and see theft and see abuse and see all kinds of horrible behavior and say there's something wrong here. Sin exists. Like that, that's something that we're all able to see without having the law. And we're even able to grasp that there is sin inside of us without the law because we have a conscience. And we know when we do something that is wrong, there's something inside of us that says, hey, it wasn't the right thing to do. It makes us feel bad about it. it. makes us recognize that we're not perfect. So the general awareness of the existence of sin isn't what the law did. And the acknowledgement that we sometimes do something wrong isn't what the law did. But what the law did was tell him where it was, what it was, and how bad it was. Uh, so think of a road where there's a lot of deer crossing in the evening. What do they put up along that road to warn drivers? They, they put up signs, right? Deer crossing signs. Deer are dangerous, okay? That's something that's often not really grasped. But if you're driving and a deer gets in front of your car, that is dangerous to your car, to yourself, to the other people in your car, to other cars around you. The deer is dangerous when it's out there on the road and you're driving. It's a legitimate danger to drivers. Are the signs a danger? Well, only if you're not driving on the road, which I certainly hope you are. <laughs> You've got bigger problems than the deer or the signs if the sign itself is a danger to you. But the signs alert you to the real danger. Now, you knew without a sign that deer exist. Right? I mean, you're aware of that. You know that they exist. And you might even be aware that they could be in places like this where you're at. But that sign tells you, hey, 
right here, you'd better be paying attention. This is the danger here. And elsewhere, you'll have elk crossing and armadillo crossing and kangaroo crossing signs. Depending on where you're at, the sign may change. But where there's a specific danger, they will often alert you to that by a sign. Now, um, suppose you removed all those signs. Stupid signs cluttering up the lovely view of nature along the road. Garish, ugly things, and we don't like them. I'm, I mean, I, I really don't. I'm driving down this beautiful fall road, you know, with all the color-changed leaves around. There's a big, ugly sign there and some obviously man-made color with a bad drawing of a deer on it. <laughs> That's just kind of ugly. Uh, we, don't, we don't necessarily like them. But would removing the sign remove the danger of the deer? Well, no, of course not. In fact, the danger would be worse because we might not be warned about it where it is greatest. But that's how a lot of people want to treat the law today. They, they want to view it as something that they don't like. It constrains and restricts them. They don't like the looks of it. It clutters up their lives. So they want to live without it. They want to live in the adultery, the fornication, the lying, the stealing, the complaining, the revenge taking. But taking away the signs doesn't take away the danger. Taking away the law doesn't take away the sin, it only takes away the awareness of it, the alertness to the danger. So now, now flip that around though. There's that road with all the deer and all the signs warning about them. Suppose all the deer were turned into venison and we ate them for a wild beast feast. That would be an excellent solution in many cases. Would we still need the signs? Well, no, because the danger is taken care of. The danger isn't there now. So you don't need the sign for the danger. Since the road is free from the deer, it's also free from the signs that warned about the deer. With the danger gone, the signs can be gone too. Just so, sin is the real danger in our lives, not the law. But the law was what alerted us to the danger of sin. It's what told us what it was, where it was, how bad it was. Once the sin was dealt with by Christ and we receive him into our lives, then the purpose of the law is fulfilled and we aren't under it anymore. It's done its job. Now, in Paul's case, he thought he was good. And by comparison to most human beings, he was. He thought he was a moral, righteous man. He was better than most of the people around him by any objective measurement. And he points out that he would not have seen his sin for what it was if it weren't for the law. He wouldn't have known about that danger until it was too late. He says, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the law had said, you know, the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet, and it gives this whole list of things that you're not supposed to desire. The gist of it is that you're not supposed to desire what's not rightfully yours. Things that God has not appointed to you to have, you're not supposed to live in this craving desire for. He still would have had the desires, see, without the law. But he wouldn't have known that they were the problem they were if the law hadn't told him, Thou shalt not covet. In a way, that command is a warning not to value the things of this world above the things of God, not to desire the things that God has said that you shouldn't have. And that was one of the hardest commands for self-righteous people to grasp and to observe. Remember the rich young ruler, Matthew 19. That, I think, was his sin. Hey, he honored his father and mother. He, he remembered the Sabbath. He did a lot of things. But when Jesus said, okay, get rid of the things of this world and follow me, the man left because he wanted things more than he wanted God. And that was a problem. So far from the law being sin, the law was what alerted Paul to the sin in his own life. It defined it. It pointed it out. It said right there, yeah, you know you're not perfect, but you're a sinner. Right there is the sin, the violation of the character and the will of God. But sin is sneaky and tricky. It wasn't done with Paul yet. It doesn't give up easily. Just knowing that sin is there is not enough to deliver a person from it. And sin itself will promise all kinds of wrong deliverance. It'll, it'll tell you, kind of like Br'er Rabbit with the bramble bush, you know, just toss me into the bramble bush and that'll take care of the problem. And then when you do that, it laughs and says, I was born and bred in the bramble bush. 
You all know Aesop's fables and all? Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> I'm seeing some blank expressions out there from these stories that I was uh, read as a child. Yeah, you, you remember the rabbit, you know, he's always causing trouble and he finally gets caught and he's like, oh, no, no, please don't throw me in the bramble bush. That'd be terrible. I'm terrified of the bramble bush. And of course, the guy that caught him is like, I've had it with this thing. All right, I am going to throw you in the bramble bush. And of course, that's right where the rabbit wanted to go. Well, sin does that too. Sin will make up all kinds of solutions for itself. And then when you take them, it'll laugh because it gave you that solution in the first place. It will take and twist even what God has promised and what God has intended for good, deceiving it about its purpose and its power. Now, we are coming into a tricky passage here, in my opinion, because sin itself is tricky. So let's look at this. I'll share with you what I think it's saying and what it means here. Chapter 7, verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Okay, so three words here that are the same Greek word. Lust, covet, and concupiscence. The three different English words with slightly different nuance or implications, but they're all the same Greek word for that wrong desires, that desire for something God doesn't want you to have. So sin took occasion. It found an opportunity. It says it again uh, in verse 11 for sin, taking occasion by the commandment. That means that sin found an opportunity in the law. It waited for the opportune moment and it saw the law and it seized on that opportunity to to its ends. Now, those ends were not God's ends. God gave the law for one purpose, but sin grasped that law and tried to twist and pervert it to sin's purpose. The end of sin is death and it will use anything it can. Even religion, even the name of Jesus, even the word of God, sin will use everything it can to bring people to death. That doesn't make Jesus or the word of God or the law wrong. That means they must be used rightly. They must be discerned according to how God intended them to be used. Well, it's no surprise that sin would be deceptive and deceiving, would it? taking even something God had designed for life and using it to bring people to death. Satan, the tempter who drew mankind to our very first sin, did it by deception. Our first sin on earth was believing the lie. Sin relies on deception, on people believing lies. It takes God's truth and twists it until people don't believe it anymore or are believing something they think God said and he didn't really say. So, the law, so sin took the law and tricked Paul with it. It says in verse 11, sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me. So sin took the law and tricked Paul with it. Uh, since the law defined what Paul shouldn't want or have, by having all those things you shouldn't want, that gave sin more things to draw him to want. Since lust was wanting something that God said you shouldn't have, When you finally get the whole list of the things God says you shouldn't have, now sin has a whole playground to work on. All kinds of things that you're not supposed to have that it can tempt you to warn. I mean, Satan just had one tree to work with when he tempted Eve. Imagine if he'd had a thousand trees or 500 trees or whatever that God said you shouldn't have for him to work with. Sin has all of this to work with now. The law said you're not supposed to have this. You're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to want this. And so sin comes along and says... Yeah, yeah, God said, ah, you're not really going to die. Doesn't it look good? Doesn't that look good? It can tailor the attack to the person because there's so many different things that the law said not to do. The law is a powerful thing, both to turn people away from sin and for sin to use to pull people in deeper. Verse 9, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. So I think verses 9 and 10 here are experiential. He's not talking in spiritual absolutes. He's talking about his experience. The clue there is in that I found this to be this way. Not God ordained. You see that God ordained. It was ordained to life. But 
my experience was this. So this is subjective here, these two verses, Paul's own experience. He's explaining how he felt as all this unfolded in his life, how it seemed to him, not necessarily what the spiritual realities and absolutes were. Um, Really, when he says that he was alive without the law once, that's not really true, is it? Because we're dead in trespasses and sins. The, the early part of the book made it really clear that law or no law, we're all sinners and we're all under God's condemnation, that sin is wrong. Whether you know the law or don't know the law, sin is still wrong. And you face the penalty for that. But Paul was talking about the experience of his life. He was rolling along, fine. He was feeling good about himself. He felt alive. He felt like he deserved and possibly even possessed eternal life. But then he saw something in the law. The commandment came. And when it did, sin revived, came to life in his awareness. And he realized that he was a sinner, that he was dead. He was separated to God by his sins, sins that he now knew through the law. And that made him feel like the law was something unto death. Uh, You ever get caught for doing something wrong and instead of blaming yourself for doing something wrong, you blame the rule? (laughs) Well, that's a stupid rule. They shouldn't have that law. (laughs) Well, I mean, you you broke the law. And honestly, objectively, what you did was wrong. But sometimes it's easier for us to blame the law than it is ourselves for breaking it. Uh, He says, look, I was doing great. And then along came the law and said, Paul, you're doing something wrong. And he said, ah, it's like it killed me. Made him feel like the law was something unto death. But sin wasn't done yet. Verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So once again, sin took occasion by the commandment. It seized on its opportunity. It had used that whole list of things you're not supposed to do as like the playbook of temptation. And then when he fell into it and the law convicted him of that, then it seized on the law again, took occasion once again by the law and deceived Paul using the law. Now he says the law is not what deceived him. The law was absolutely true. It was sin that deceived him by the law. Well, how could sin deceive someone by the law? Perhaps by tricking him about what the law was for. He, like so many others, apparently thought that if they could just keep enough of the law, they would have spiritual life. If, if they could keep enough of the Ten Commandments, if they could make the good on the scales, outbalance the bad on the scales, but there's no scales. The, the idea of, of a God sitting up above, weighing our good works against our bad works and judging based on which, that's completely not in the Bible. It's not how God works. That's sin deceiving people. Now, If anybody was honest with themselves, like Paul, they could see that they'd failed to keep part of the law. But sin tried to use the law as the solution for the problem it was meant to define. Sin was never, I mean, the law was never meant as a cure for sin. It was meant as a revealer of sin. You ever go to the doctor and get diagnosed? Say you go to the doctor, uh, say for COVID, they give you the COVID test, and the test comes back positive and says, yep, you've got COVID. Do you walk away from there saying, I'm cured, I took the test? No, the law was the test, not the cure. But sin was trying to tell him, just keep taking the test. Just keep stuffing that thing up your nose. You'll feel great after a little bit. It'll it'll fix you, it'll cure you. You just keep taking the test. Sin's deception. You just do enough of the law, you keep enough of the rules, you obey enough of the commandments, you you restrict yourself enough and control yourself enough and look around and look how much better you are than everybody else enough and hey, you'll be great, you'll feel good, you'll be fine. That's sin taking occasion by the commandment to bring people to death. God meant that commandment to bring people to life by showing them they were dead and then they would know they needed Him to give them life. But sin took that commandment and deceived them. Sin works from our hearts. And our hearts, our cells, what's deep inside of us is deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. 
Our heart is Satan's ally. We are always trying to deceive ourselves. And Satan is just helping it along. And he'll latch on to anything around us, anything he can, even the law of God, and twist that and use that to try to help us deceive ourselves. Sin springs from the heart. And it tricked Paul. And it tries to trick anyone else who knows the law into thinking that if they just try harder and keep enough of the law, they'll be okay. It ends up encouraging pride and self-righteousness. Those evil desires of verse 8, that concupiscence. You start to think that, I'm doing pretty good. You don't even have to grade me on a curve. I looked over the commands. I'm grading out at a solid 95. I'm making an A in this course of life. <laughs> Look at that guy over there, man. He's, he's barely making a D. I got a better grade in this class than he does. That's never what the law was meant for, to give people a way to measure themselves against each other, to give people a way to cure the sickness of sin. In reality, all that is going on is sin strangling you to death. And it's doing it with the cord that God gave for a lifeline to pull us to Christ. The law was meant to say, you need Jesus. And people were using it to say, you don't need Jesus. That's what sin does. It takes and twists and perverts the truth to the point that it's unrecognizable for what God said and intended it to be. So at the conclusion then, he says, verse 12... Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. When we say we don't want to be legalists, when we say we're not under the law, when we say that Jesus Christ has freed us from the law, we're not saying that the law was bad. The law is holy. The law was something given by God and set apart to God. The commandments of the law were holy. They were just. That means righteous. They were the right things for God to say. And it was good. It had a right and a good and a beneficial purpose in this world and in the lives of those who were under it. The law was a good thing. Just because sin perverted the purpose of the law does not invalidate the purpose of the law. It's like saying, say, I drag somebody up here and drown them in the baptistry. Does that mean you should stop drinking water? No. Just because something can be used to harm someone does not mean that thing is bad. It means the one who used it that way is bad. Sin uses the law to keep people in bondage when the law was supposed to point people the way out of bondage. And that way is Jesus Christ, the only one who fulfilled the law and therefore could set us free from it. It was meant to be a lifeline and sin makes it a noose. The law is not sin, it's holy. It couldn't save us. Because it's only a guide to tell us that we need salvation and show us where to find it. To point us with a huge neon glowing arrow to the one person in the entire history of the entire world who actually kept the whole law, Jesus Christ. It was the signpost that pointed us to him. He was the fulfillment of the prophecies and the pictures that were written in the law. It was to point us to him. But sin will take that signpost and paint over some of the words and tell you you'll be fine on your own if you just stay right here in the law, doing the works, keeping the commands. The law itself is holy, righteous, and good. Verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. The law, which was good, was not made death to Paul. But sin is so bad that it took what God designed for good, pointing people to Jesus Christ, and used it to work death in Paul. It suckered him into its lie that if he could just keep enough of the law, he'd be good enough to approach God. And what that did... It kind of backfires on sin because it shows just how terrible sin is. That it doesn't just take bad things and use them for bad. Sin is so bad that it takes good things and uses them for bad. 
Sin is so bad that it takes things that God designed and gave us for good, and it twists and perverts and uses them against God and against us to our destruction and our rebellion against God. And it illustrates that it does that with everything. God gave us food, right? Food's good. I like food. I'm really glad we get food. How many people have died from the way they've used food? Sex is good. God gave it to us in marriage, and it's good. How many families have been destroyed by adultery? Sin does that. It takes things that God gives us for good and uses them to wreak havoc in our lives, our families, our society, our faith. It'll even take God's word, the law, and twist it so that it's unrecognizable for what God intended it to be and do and use it to bring death. So what's our relationship to the law? There's a few possibilities as we go through this. One is that we're standing in a place like Paul was early in his life where we've never even considered it. We're thinking we're pretty good. Alive as can be, probably even deserve eternal life. Good works, pretty good. Bad works, eh, not too bad. I'm doing great here. We've never looked at the law. We've never looked through those, even the Ten Commandments. We've never even looked at the two great commandments and said, have I always loved God with all that I am? Well, that's one place people stand in relation to the law. They've never even looked at it, never even thought about it, never compared its standard to their lives. And so they think they're doing okay. Then there's a second stage. Maybe you've realized, I have desired things I shouldn't have desired. I have taken the name of the Lord in vain. I have not loved God like I'm supposed to love God. I have hated or I have been unjustly angry or I have sought revenge. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. The law has pointed out that, that I've done things that are wrong. Well, in that stage, what are you doing about it? Are you trying to use the test as the cure? Are you letting sin take the lifeline and make a noose? Telling you that if you just do better, if you just try harder, if you just keep taking the test, you'll be okay. Don't let sin take what God intended to be your lifeline and make it your noose. The law shows you that you're a sinner, but it cannot save you from your sin. Only Jesus Christ can save you from your sin. Jesus, God's Son, died for our sins, and He rose from the dead victorious over our sins, and He lives today to save us from our sins if we'll turn from our efforts to trust Him to save us. Well, if we've crossed that bridge, then we stand in a different place compared to the law. First place, completely unconsidered. Second place, we're looking at it, and how are we going to respond? Are we going to try to live in it, or are we going to let it point us to Jesus Christ? Well, in the third place, we've come to Jesus Christ. If, if we've come to that point, then the law has done its main job. It's brought us to Christ. Now, we should still be familiar with it because it tells us a lot about God and a lot about right and wrong. And it's also what we can use to show other people their need for Jesus Christ. Paul told Timothy, the law is good if a man use it lawfully, that it's not for the believers, but it's for those who haven't come to faith in Christ yet, and they're living in violation of the law. It makes it real easy to show them that they need help, that they need salvation. They need Him now just as badly as we did before we came to Him. But we're not under that law. It could never save us, and it cannot empower our Christian life. When we struggle with sin, which is what he's about to address next, we need something other than the law to help us live out righteousness, because the law could never impart or empower righteousness. It could only punish unrighteousness and point to the real source of righteousness, Jesus Christ. Let's pray.